The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Part five of how do I do that, all right? Part five, I didn't know I was gonna get this long, but quite frankly, the more I thought about it, I could probably do 10, 15, 20 parts, but we're not gonna go there, hopefully. Um, but in part five, how do I do that? What we saw, if it, I were to oversimplify it, and trust me, this is more profound than it sounds, all the heart of the matter is always the matters of the heart. And every time we saw a discrepancy or someone struggle in their Christian walk, it was head versus heart every single time. They were trying to do sincerely too. Doesn't that complicate it when you're sincere and you're sincerely wrong? <laughs> it does complicate it. They're sincerely trying to do with their head what was intended to come from the heart. Now, uh, one of the most common things is you will see uh, individuals who will say the right answer and see, say and see before anything's happened in the heart. That's just, unfortunately, that's just Christianity. That's the, that's the common place. And some people even form the theology that if I just say it, if I just confess the scriptures, if I just decree and declare the scriptures over and over. And there's a place for decree and declaring and there's a place for confessing the scriptures. Even praying the scriptures is wise. But that is not an end in itself because I, we ministered to more hurting people that did pray after me prayers, but it never transpired as an exchange or a supernatural transaction in the heart. Even something as simple as forgiveness. We've taught forgiveness around the world, literally and saw breakthroughs. I've been trying to forgive for two years. I'll guarantee you, if you've been trying to forgive, you're in the head. And, you know, Romans uh, 10, 9 and 10, you know, it says, if you would believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, that's Romans 10, 10. But even if you reverse it, Romans 10, 9 says, if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. But the point of the matter is, no matter which one comes first, it has to be in the heart or what you're confessing isn't going to do a thing. Now, what's happened traditionally is there are well-meaning Christians who were so intent on getting it right that they would confess and they would confess and they would confess and then accidentally open their heart to it. They would <laughs> relinquish and yield. Can you imagine doing something right by accident? Yeah. You can get so exhausted trying your way that when you get exhausted, you finally relax and let God do it in your heart. So the heart of the matter is always matters of the heart. Any discrepancy in your Christian walk, the flesh lusts against the spirit. The spirit, I promise you, your head isn't going to do it by itself. That's the independent self. And when we say you in this church, we are not talking about the you where apart from him, you can do nothing. That's the independent you who's sincere and trying. But how about the I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? That's a different you. It's the you of the new creation that's coming from the heart where you and Jesus are joined together. They that are joined to the to the Lord, are one spirit with him. It's got to be that one spirit that accomplishes, not you trying to say the right thing. We ministered to professional counselors, and we had them we weeping, didn't we, Jennifer? Uh, they had all the right answers. These people were well taught. But they, in their coursework, they repeated the prayers after. I forgive everyone in my father's side. I forgive my mother. I forgive my dad. I forgive that wayward daughter of mine. I forgive. That doesn't mean that there's a transaction. That doesn't mean that you did it right. It means you said the right answer. And we are so fast to say and see what hasn't transpired. 
Believe in your heart, then confess with your mouth. We like to say it all the time. And matter of fact, even on the uh, on the online school, and that, uh, people from around the world, we've got about 3,000 people on the online school, and from around the world, every now and then you get into somebody saying, well, I've been saying it, and I've been seeing it, and I've been seeing Jesus do this, and see Jesus do that. No, no, you missed the whole point. You might as well start over again. It's not about seeing what Jesus did. It's about actually allowing, letting, yielding, surrendering, and let Jesus do it, then say it. We have that backwards. We've always had it backwards. The failure to, to get it. So I want to cover some, how did I do that? How do I do that? Well, uh, on number five, what we're going to talk about is the location of the heart. I even saw something just recently. Somebody was talking about, you got to break soul ties. And they had a picture of, of, of two people, and the attachment was to the blood pumper. <laughs> even the picture is erroneous. That's not where the attachment happens. You have as many neurons, almost as many neurons that you have in your head, in your brain, as you have in the gut. It's like computer, computer. There is a few neurons that do go to the physical heart, but it's like a computer chip compared to the second brain, they're even calling it. The gut knows things that the head don't know, and it goes up the left vagus nerve and informs the mind. So the matters that concern you always start here. You can try to wrestle with it up here, but good luck. I've seen people who spend their, uh, a great deal of their Christian time trying to renounce something, you know, like, uh, and, and say the right scriptures. If down here there's fear, you're not accomplishing anything saying, a perfect love cast out fear, a perfect love cast out fear. You're giving the right answer, but that fear is ruling. Emo cognition, emo volition. The emotions control the choices and the emotions control the product. Um, so <clears throat> here's what we're going to do today. Um, we're going we're gonna to start with the location of the heart. Because remember last week we even said, what did we say last week? That the three problem areas that we saw continually ministering to in one way or another was location, value system. And what we want to do by value system is the Word of God is the value system. But church people have very easily adapted to the culture. And they place the value system that's coming from culture, not the Bible. So we have to be aware of that. If you want to see radical change in your life, you need to see, first of all, location, is it coming from the heart? And actually even knowing where the other parts are. It's not that complicated, and every Christian should memorize it. Conscience is here, in the gut. It's the voice of your spirit. Does that make sense? You know, even unsaved people have a conscience, but based on their value system, it might be really corrupt. So certain things don't bother them. But the conscience is the voice of their human spirit, saved or unsaved. The trouble is, is the value system. If it's not the word of God, you know, it's, it's very iffy of what they feel is right or wrong. You know, they'll say, your truth and my truth and other people's truth. No, Jesus is the truth, okay? And he's not divided, nor is he conflicted. So in... Uh, this fifth section, I want to talk about the location of the heart. Without going into too much detail, Jennifer's a science, science person here once, and she just loves looking this stuff up. All right. But the, the heart is the center of man's inward life. It's the severe of divine influence. What's divine influence means? Spiritual influence. You want the influence. You want to be under the influence of Jesus, not the world, the flesh, or the devil. And that the rivers of living water, the scripture says, even at, during the time of the Feast of Tabernacle, Jesus cried out. It said, out of your, anyone comes to me and drink, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Now, most translations, so, you know, I understand where the confusion is, but still, at what point are you going to learn the difference? Because most translations say, out of the heart. Newer translations. But in this Old Testament, it says, Jesus said uh, in the New Testament, 
as the scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. That's King James. I think New King James. I don't know. King James. But if you did a study in the Hebrew and the Greek, it's belly, bowels, gut, womb. What's that tell you? Belly, gut, bowels, womb. That isn't up here. That's not this blood pumper. There's only one verse of scripture that refers to this blood pumper that's not literal, not the hidden man of the heart. And that is that men's hearts will fail for fear. Remember that little computer chip in there? The emotions can rise up, rise up that, and you can be so frightened that you can have a heart attack. But other than that, it's not this. At what point are we going to recognize that the innermost being, the belly, the bowels? And it says, like, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching all the innermost rooms of the belly. Where you need ministry is in the heart, the heart, the heart, the heart. Now, in the Old Testament, Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard our heart, for out of it springs the issues of life. It is not this. This is not where the issues of life come from. Guard your heart, for out of it spring the issues of life. It's not going to contradict Jesus. Jesus is saying, out of the heart, out of the heart, out of the gut, out of the belly. Now, your body is the voice of the world. It pays attention to everything that's going on. Your spirit, conscience, is the voice of your spirit. And we want to get the soul under the authority or influence, is a better word, of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to become more God-inside-minded, but make sure that God inside is down here in your spirit, the epicenter, the door of the heart. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. It wasn't up here. I stand at the door of a heart. If anyone open, open, opens the heart, I will come in. Now, how did you get saved? Well, at some point you decided, I need that. You might have struggled a little bit. Different people respond differently, some but they hear the gospel preached and saving faith is at some point, whether you knew what you were doing or not, you opened, you surrendered, you opened your heart and he came in and you said, come into my heart. I welcome you. I respond to that message I heard. Come into my heart. Cleanse me of my sin. He, ha he can't cleanse you of your sin from the outside. He you have to invite him in. Cleanse me of sin, and I will live for you and serve you. So the heart must take, and then you confess with your mouth what? Jesus is Lord of my life. The other way is not going to work. Jesus is Lord of my life. Jesus is Lord of my life. I said the prayer, and I still feel like I'm a mess. Well, you might still be a mess. <laughs> you know, we don't know. You need Jesus, but you need him in your heart. How many places have we gone? We had to teach simple forgiveness because in Matthew 18, it says, unless you forgive from the heart. That also implies that you can forgive from your head and not work. <laughs> so, the Old Testament, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength. You know, uh, the word in Strong's is actually, I can't pronounce Hebrew, but it's M-E, Mark, A-H, M-E-A-H, Mea, Mea, Mea. I'll make I, one thing I learned about the Hebrew and the Greek. I say it whatever way I want to. S some of those names in the Old Testament, I say it whatever way I want to. You can correct me, and you can go find out the proper way. And I, I suggest you do it because I just say, I just do phonics. Now, if the location of the heart is in the belly, translated figuratively as heart, literally means intestines, abdomen, belly, stomach, womb. Belly, bowels, I delight to do thy will, O oh my God. My law, thy law is within my heart. Me, ah, M-E-A-H, bowels, belly, intestine. Something like this should have been taught when you were in Sunday school, but it usually isn't. Our children's books have it, the location of the heart. 
One little boy even got in trouble because he, he told his, uh, some secular person, I have two hearts. I have, <laughs> I have one that pumps blood and I've got my Bible heart. Of course, they were a non-believer, so they didn't like that at all. And probably said, what is this kid learning? Oh, my goodness. What a... But at the same time, those kids grow up, and if they experience in their heart the reality of Jesus, they never forget. They can always go back to something that you knew. But you can't go back to something you never did right. <laughs> I mean, you can, but it doesn't work any better. You know, it's like hitting your head against the wall. How many times do I do this before I get better? Probably not. It was like the old, uh, the old business example. Uh, Martha, we're losing a dollar on every sale. How many do we have to sell before we make a profit? <laughs> That's kind of what the spiritual life is for some. I've been trying. I've been trying. Okay? But Jesus said, I, I delight to do thy will. I have food that you know not of. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. That kind of spiritual talk is something that's coming from the heart, not the head. The head is, at best, trying to explain what's going on subjectively that's real. Truth is Jesus. Jesus is reality. Now, here's one that uh, we, we minister to a lot. It says uh, in, in Psalm twenty two fourteen. 14, he says, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart, lev, okay, is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels, mea, okay? Psalm twenty two fourteen. 14. Another used word is uh, betin, literally meaning belly, abdomen, inward parts, womb, and sometimes the seat of physical hunger. But it's also used figuratively for the innermost being or heart. Now, when a person gets ministry and they deal with bitter roots or uh, judgments they've made, you know, you who judge, you're going to do this. Uh, you, you who judge, you will receive by the same measure. Because sowing and reaping don't go away just because you think you know better than somebody else. But what it says is the words of a gossip, a talebearer, are like wounds that go down into the innermost parts of the belly, beaten, belly, abdomen, womb, inner man, heart. So where do these words of a gossip go? They don't go just here. If you just live here, you are clueless in your Christian walk because the spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. This has to be the wounds of a tail bear go down here. And those wounds are hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame. They hurt. As a matter of fact, uh, one of, and Jennifer's studying of the science or the anatomy of our makeup, spirit, soul, and body, the thing she found out about the soul that I thought was important. You know, the initial sin was God kicked Adam and Eve when they sinned out of the garden. Rejection registers in the physical brain the same as physical pain. But without facing that pain and giving that to Jesus, he's the only one that can take it away. And where is it? It went down into the innermost being. And guess what? That pain, that hurt, the rejection, the fear, it doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. Just because you choose to, with your mind and your will, override it, which you can do temporarily. But what gets suppressed will get expressed later. And it will pop out at probably all the wrong times when you're, when you're not. Because it doesn't die. They're like little... little uh, landmines that go off. But guess what? They don't go off one time <laughs> until you deal with it periodically. <clears throat> they go off. So the Bible heart, to me, you have to believe in your heart to be saved, but you also have to forgive from the heart. And Romans 10, 9 
may say it backwards, but the other had to precede it. Ten nine says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, you will be saved. It almost looks like you confess first, and but you're confessing what you believe in your heart. The heart had to be first. And the very next verse, Romans 10.10 10 says, with the heart man believes and with the mouth confession is made. But I can see where, you know, we, we've gotten so good at giving the right answers without having the answer manifest as part of the divine nature that we desperately need. We need the reality of Jesus in the Word. Jesus and His Word are one. Now, in the New Testament, it's cardia, meaning heart. And it can either be figurative or physical. However, it's used 159 times for our emotional and spiritual center and it's used literally in only one verse, and we just said that. Uh, <clears throat> Men's heart failing for fear, Luke 21, 26. That's the only one that's referring to this, Luke 21, 26. Men's hearts, cardia, failing them from fear and the expectation of those things coming upon the earth. But John 14, 1, let not your heart, cardia, the center of man's inward life, be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. This is referring to the innermost being. So I can see where heart has confused, but it's never really changed. You have a spirit. The literal meanings of the Greek word, <clears throat> here's another word for belly, in John 7:38 or koilia in the Greek. Koilia literally means belly, abdomen, bowel, stomach, and womb. Figuratively, koilia refers to the innermost being or the heart. All right, I'm not going to labor this anymore, but if that transition is not made in a Christian's life, unfortunately, they live far, far, far below their, their potential, far below their potential. So... <clears throat> Behold, I stand at the door. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Again, if he's standing at the door of the heart, this is the epicenter, this is the door of the heart, and knocks, and you have to open it, where's your will then? Consent is here, but the will is, I open my heart and let him in. I open my heart to receive what I'm hearing when I'm reading the scriptures. I'm opening my heart while I'm reading. That's the difference between dead letter and the opening of it. You know, the anointing from Jesus within flows out from the belly. We know that. Therefore, it's the epicenter of our spirit. <clears throat> the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord. Some trans modern translations say flashlight. The spirit of man is the flashlight of the Lord, searching all the innermost parts of the belly. Do you know that David did that? And he said, search me for secret faults. What he was saying is, it's not about my rational mind figuring things out. You search me, and I'll deal with what you show me. Secret. They're secret to me. But if you knit me together in my mother's womb, I trust you to search out and know where the knots are. Okay? Now... <clears throat> All of you should, in this room, know this, but believe it or not, this is not common knowledge by experience. So we're going to see how, how do I do that? How do I touch God in prayer? How do I make this life real? How do I abide in the vine? You know, we, uh, we use the term drop down a lot, which really means... Uh, in duo in the Greek, which means to sink into in order to be clothed. Doesn't it say that the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind? Well, where's the peace of God? He himself is our peace. He guards our heart and our mind, but you go to him for him to guard your mind. Peace will guard your heart and your mind. Now, here's, here's a little tool that might help you. If you want to walk more effectively in the spirit. You want to check yourself out to see to what degree am I walking in the flesh, to what degree am I walking in the spirit. Revelation, that revealed word, that thing that's quickened to you off the scripture, should rule over your mind. It should have influence on your mind. The word of God, both the written 
and the revelation of it should have rule over your thinking because that's going to help develop your value system which we said apart from location value system was the next weakest area we saw the third weakest area was the lack of effort everybody wanted somebody to do it to me but I really don't want to apply myself much other than receive freely well that's good for salvation but you can't camp out there forever there needs to be effort the Lord basically said that too, didn't he? He said, seek me and find me and search for me with all of your heart. It's not a casual walk in the woods. It's not camping out after you're saved and doing nothing. It's seek me, you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. There's effort implied there that, believe it or not, uh, even with something like the 60-day challenge, I've had people say, 60 days. Oh, you have plans for the next, are, you have something more important than Jesus for the next 60 days? You don't plan on being around for 60 days? Uh, what's your point? The point is, it's an indicator of a lack of a lack of spiritual commitment or effort to pro procure more Jesus in your life. Now, we're teaching that if revelation is to influence your mind and the Word of God, you want to read the Word. There's people don't even read their Bible. And there's statistics out there that I won't repeat because they're too horrible. And yet alone reading it, conscience should rule over your will. Even Fortunately, even unsaved people who have a terrible value system still have a conscience and occasionally still do what's right. <laughs> okay? Somewhere they got a value system that said, don't do that. Don't shoot your neighbor, Okay? Others haven't. The third one is communion should rule over your emotions. Communion means spirit-to-spirit -spirit engagement, touch. They that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him. That's the new creation reality. The new creation reality is you need touch. Now, the church uh, over the decades uh, usually doesn't even talk about emotions because they're problematic. I say your emotions are your friends. You know why? Because if you've got anger, hurt, fear, guess what? You're not walking with Jesus right now. And in a friendly kind of way, they're telling you Jesus isn't Lord right now. You've got hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame. But the good news is you can forgive from the heart and get your peace back. So you can connect, you can disconnect, but you can reconnect. It doesn't sound worth it to me. So abiding in the vine, we keep our heart open to God so we can enjoy. But one thing is about people say, well, I need to drop down and deal with that. Drop, drop down. Quite frankly, the challenge should be in abiding. You should be able to stay down and occasionally rise up and go, whoa, I don't want to do that. I let it get back to normal. Normal should be abiding, not dropping down only in problematic times. Otherwise, you just live whatever way you want to. That's carnality. Now, reconnect with the presence of God, mind, will, and emotions. All three of your soulish nature needs to submit to him. Then we teach you how to remove barriers. What about, what about when I'm, I, 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 I don't have peace because my boss is making me mad and I try to dismiss it mentally and I still feel the anger? Well, it's because... You can't do it in the flesh. It's not going to go away anyway. You might, you might, with your mind and your will, go, Hi, boss. How's it going today? You could override all that anger and hostility and hide it, but guess what? It's still there. It didn't go anywhere. It didn't die. You just tried to override in a clever way with your mind and your will. But guess what? What gets suppressed will get expressed. You'll take it out on something. If it's not the boss, you go home, take it out on your husband or wife. Right? Kick the dog. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> but whatever it is, whatever gets suppressed will get expressed. Now, when you forgive, this is essential. This is, there's a huge audience out there that really, really needs to experience this, not understand it. When you forgive from the heart, uh, 
the one that's the most common is if a person's been abused sexually or raped. Uh, so far, when we did one-on-ones for 12 years, and then I did it in my previous pastorate, uh, everybody in the church one at a time. I can't do that no more. <laughs> Instead, I'm training you to do it to other people, right? Um, I would release forgiveness. Say, say the person was raped. Release forgiveness to the perpetrator. And they go, what? Forgive them? They don't deserve it. You, you missed the total end point. You missed, you missed biblical definition of forgiveness. It isn't about what they deserve. It's about whether or not you want to walk out of that prison of resentment. When you forgive them, they're still responsible for their own life. They still are accountable to God. You're not God. You release forgiveness, it takes the pain. Jesus is the only one that can take the pain. And you release that perpetrator. That doesn't mean you're going to be friends. doesn't mean you're going to reconcile. Forgiveness and reconciliation are not the same. You release forgiveness to him and you get peace that you're no longer being controlled by that person, whether they ever change or not. Does that make sense? I do not want to be under control of any person, place, or thing other than Jesus. And how do I do that then? That means if you were raped, that perpetrator should go to jail. You release forgiveness does not get out of jail free card. He may still have to go to jail. But you release forgiveness sets you out of the prison of being controlled by that person. You're giving them over to God. You're releasing them. You're releasing yourself. But you might have to forgive yourself too because a lot of people that are in those situations blame themselves. So forgiveness has to go toward the perpetrator. Forgiveness has to go toward self. You may have judged yourself, said, I shouldn't have been out that night by myself. It's my fault. Well, it's not about whose fault it is totally. It's about whether or not you respond properly. So I receive forgiveness for judging myself that it was my fault that I brought it on. And then lastly, why did God let that happen? I know people don't go to church anymore because they've judged God, who didn't do anything wrong, but in their opinion, he didn't do it their way. Why did God let that happen? Well, until you release forgiveness for that judgment that you made against God, you're not going to be free. So forgiveness goes in how many directions? Three. Believe it or not, that is not common knowledge at least not common practice. God didn't do anything wrong, even though he never does anything wrong. People get angry at him. (laughs) It's it's just life. When we forgive God, we're releasing the judgment we made against himself. Angry, disappointed, ashamed of ourselves, we need to receive forgiveness for judging ourselves so harshly. All right? Now, when I discipled Jennifer, and I taught her these things, She documented how the Holy Spirit works. So I know if you're you're still a head person, you're going to call it a method or a formula. But that only indicates that the structure is man-made. No, no. This is a structure of the way the Holy Spirit works. That's God-made. You know, God does according to a pattern based on principles. All through the scriptures, God builds according to a pattern based on principles. And these principles, whether it's sowing and reaping, that's not man-made. That simply says, that law operates whether you like it or not. Be not deceived. God's not mocked. What you sow, you're going to reap unless you repent and receive forgiveness. Right? Now, here's, here's the six steps. And Jennifer did it all when she was doing a... uh, conference, or you were at a retreat, I think it was, and she needed, I only have X amount of time, so let's assume that you're watching, you only got X amount of time, but you want to help your friend, your Christian friend, pray through something. Jennifer did it with one, two, three, four, five F's, five F words to make it easy, all right? The fir- well, the first one, though, is before you can start anything, Get people to close their eyes and pray. 
why would you want tell them to close their eyes? A head person will keep their eyes open, and the tendency will be to analyze, censor, critique. What you're trying to do is get them to go to their spirit. And fortunately, when people close their eyes, there is a tendency, not a guarantee, there is a tendency that they actually go to their heart. It's like when you swallow food, unless you didn't chew properly, uh, you really don't pay attention to it going down. But if you chose to pay attention to the food going down, to your, you could actually perceive it, couldn't you? You could feel food going down. You can do the same thing with prayer. You can feel very faintly, like swallowing, going down. And when you're down, you're in at least an attitude of prayer. Now, we had blue cards printed out in our material. And one time a guy came to a conference that we were doing in Massachusetts. He came from New Hampshire or Maine or somewhere. And he came at the last minute when the conference was all over. His wife was there for the whole conference. And we handed out blue cards. We're closing the meeting with the blue card. And he read in a very monotone way off the blue card, and his wife got powerful ministry. She started weeping, got healing. The joy of the Lord took over after that. All he did was read it off the card. But because it's the way God works, she happened to, oh, get this, she happened to cooperate <laughs> from the heart. And I think the one that needed ministry then was the husband because he saw all this was happening. He's going, I didn't do nothing. I didn't do nothing. I didn't, I, what did I do? I didn't do nothing. I just, I just read off the card. Precisely. We don't really need you. Okay. <laughs> and that's really what we're trying to get the church re-educated re in is that you can do this yourself. We've taught people to do self-deliverance. But you know, we've been so influenced by someone coming and doing deliverance for us, over us, right? Do it to us. Yeah, you can do it that way too. But even then, it's only going to work to the degree that that person is yielded. But you can teach a Christian that's been around for a long time that, you know what, if you close, teach you how to close the door, the demonic activity has no place. You close the door and it will lift. How many, uh, hundreds and hundreds of people I prayed for that once they got the, the internal part done and they felt the peace on whatever they were, they closed the door and they say, something lifted off of me. A lot of times not very demonstrative. Sometimes it was, sometimes it wasn't, but for the most part, they had their own no-so that it lifted instead of me saying, there, you're done. I've seen a lot of that where nothing happened. But you're supposed to feel better and take my word for it. I want them to have their own supernatural spiritual know-so. Like with salvation. I need to know that I know. I don't need somebody to tell me I am. Right? Now here it is. We're going to do this right now. And if you're watching, you can get ministry right now just doing this. I'm going to be that guy that just reading the, the blue card but you open up your, close your eyes and open up your heart and let it happen. Are you ready? All right. You're in an attitude of prayer. First, person or situation that comes to mind, just nod your head. This is what you do in a corporate setting. Private setting, we would ask them, who do you see? First person or situation. For altar ministry, it's nobody else's business what you're going through. So we just have them nod their head. You got a person or situation? Mm. Put your hand down on their belly. It's the seat of the emotions, the door of the heart, where the will is, the conscience. What's the emotion? Hurt. Then let Jesus the forgiver which is you and him together flow to that hurt and out of your belly flows a river of forgiveness 
when it changes to peace, you have a supernatural exchange. I release forgiveness. And there was a supernatural transaction that took place. I have peace. Wow. First, then I felt the emotion. And remember, when you feel the emotion, you don't have to weep and wail for six hours. Momentarily, enough to where you're giving it to Jesus. Momentarily, you're giving it to Jesus, and it will change to peace. You only, If it was a trauma, which, by the way, is a big word now, um, fear is fear. There's, there's true traumas, and then there's little fears. But to the person, they can feel pretty big no matter what they are. But all you have to do is feel it momentarily enough to say, I'm giving it to my Jesus. And when he, forgiveness flows out of the new creation reality from the heart, it will change to peace. That supernatural transaction, from that place of peace, you forgave. First, feel, forgive. This is our website. Forgive, one, two, three. I mean, it's, it's not a formula. It's not just a method. It's the way God wants to work in your heart if you let him. I will deal, God, search me, O oh God, for anxious thoughts and hurtful ways. Psalm 139. Search me. Oh, Ralph. Okay, I see Ralph. Oh, it hurts. I let Jesus the forgiver me go to that hurt and right through that hurt, and I release loving forgiveness to Ralph. Oh, I can picture. Here's, here's one place you can see. Don't be seeing Jesus do it. Please. I've seen more people waste time. I see Jesus opening the door. I see Jesus uh, forgiving him. That isn't going to do you a bit of good. You don't want to see him theoretically doing it. You want to do it in reality. So the only thing you want to see is the person that you're forgiving, not eagles, not bears, not lions. No. All right, we don't need prophetic indicators. You need a real person and a real situation. So you see the real person, and then you release forgiveness to Ralph. Ralph up here changed to peace down here. That is like a born-again experience. That is a legitimate transaction. Anything less than that, and it's wishful thinking. Anyway, let's, let's continue with that. First person or situation. Close your eyes. Every thought, by the way, don't, and don't try to fool me because I've been doing this for 48 years. Every thought has a corresponding emotion. In many cases, you choose not to feel. You have to say, I give myself permission to feel as an act of my will. You've learned over the years to suppress it. Every thought has a corresponding emotion. You're wired that way. So you can argue with it, but that usually means you've got issues <laughs> that haven't been resolved. Every thought. First person or situation, I see Ralph. What's the feeling? I don't know. I don't feel anything. All right, you get one of those. This is troubleshooting, right? Cliff and Stina. Uh, Pastors Cliff and Stina will uh, be doing troubleshooting today, I hope, in case it's necessary. I don't feel anything. Well, then, as an act of your will down here, allow yourself to feel and then we use the word momentarily is the most compassionate term you can use because nobody wants to feel yucky stuff. But until you present it to Jesus, you can't mentally present it to Jesus. You have to actually present it in the heart. The matters of the heart are the heart of the matter. I release that yuck. I feel it, that rejection, that hurt. I'm giving it to Jesus. And it flowing out of me like rivers of living water. There, I got my peace. Wow. Now, let's take this a step further. I'm sure you all have that. One, two, three. Forgive, one, two, three is our website. First, feel, forgive. <laughs> if you do it from the heart, this is not hard. This should be normal Christianity. Now, here's the other one. Occasionally. And over the years, we noticed, um, I don't know, you can do couple dozen uh, quality ministry issues without, without there being a strong lie. But every now and then, 
there will be a lie will kind of uh, make itself known at that point in time. I'm forgiving Ralph. Yeah, but, but, but Ralph is a man. Oh, okay. Well, Ralph's a man. Maybe you have men issues. We need to bring bring that lie down. It's becoming a mental stronghold. Not only did you forgive Ralph, but you've got a lie that no man can be trusted. I receive. But you heard it right then when you forgave Ralph. So that means there was a mental stronghold attached to an emotional wounding. And most emotional woundings come in at a time of trial, tribulation, relationship that's going bad. All right. So you say, I receive forgiveness for making judgment against men in general. I got my peace. Now, if you've got your peace, then that's fact. The fact is, I want to find out now that what that lie can be replaced with the truth. Now, from the place of peace, you're in the place of power. Let the peace of God rule. Jesus is ruling. From the place of peace, I can say, I renounce that lie that men can't be trusted. I've seen people agonize over renouncing stuff that never worked. They're renouncing it before they dealt with the power behind the lie. The power behind the lie is the, is the mistrust, the anger, that men can't be trusted. Until you receive forgiveness for carrying that, you're renouncing. I renounce. If that heart first, confess with your mouth. Heart first, confess with your mouth. Not confess with your mouth and then hope it changes in the heart. That's the hard way. That's going around the mountain till you get worn out and maybe do it right by accident. I renounce the lie that men can't be trusted. And I've watched this. Jennifer, this is her favorite part. We've seen this doing one-on-ones by the hundreds, hundreds of people we've sat in and seen this take place. All of a sudden, we'd say, what's the truth? After they renounced. Remember that one lady? It's never amazing. The man, Christ Jesus, I've got a man in this house. So she went from hatred of men to a revelation that the man Christ Jesus was in her. That gets written on the tablet of her heart. That will transform her total, absolute worldview. Will be more of a God worldview. And people have those bitter roots and they spring up. They not only cause you trouble, they defile other people. You push other people to sin against you. And even if you push to sin against you, there's still their sin. But the point of the matter is, take some responsibility for the fact that your push causes other people to sin. You will stand accountable for that. So deal with your stuff. And don't worry, it's always them. Every relationship that I've seen fail was always the blame game. Always. Never forgiveness. Never repentance. Always the blame game. Well, you don't understand. I don't need to understand. You don't understand Scripture. You don't understand God. You don't understand the way He works. You know, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusables because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. (laughs) Right? We are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. We should be the most forgiving people on the face of the earth. But, again, if you don't do it from the heart, what good is it? The f- failing to understand even, like uh, Jennifer went to a conference on joy. They told her everything that was in the Bible about joy, but nobody seemed to have any. <laughs> of course, if you were really sad and depressed, tendency would be you'd go to a conference on joy. <laughs> <laughs> but God, self, and others. Let's go over those those few things. You could help Christians that have been around a long time 
if you could walk them gently through and carefully through, first feel forgive. Really. First feel forgive. Every now and then we get someone on the school. Like I said, we got 3,000 on the online school from around the world. Um, every now and then you get somebody going, I took the whole 60-day challenge and I, I don't know. I think I'm still doing it in my head. It's, that's very possible. We, we dealt with Christian counselors that were weeping and crying because they dealt with all of their all of their quality work. And they were given quality programs, quality material, but they did it with pray after me prayers. No one's going to know, leave this message and not know there's a difference between pray after me prayers and internal transformation or a supernatural exchange. And how do I know that I didn't do just a pray after me prayer. It's that whatever you prayed about has a corresponding emotion. If that emotion didn't change the peace, there was no supernatural transaction or exchange. We're supposed to be living a trans, be not conformed to the world, but transformed. The transform means it has to be an internal exchange. When you can go back now, uh, let's go back. Ralph, I close my eyes, Ralph, peace. Providing I see Ralph the same way I saw him the first time. Because Ralph may have stolen my bicycle, and that brings up a whole other issue. But as long as I picture exactly what I forgave, it is permanent. That fruit remains, and the devil can't touch the fruit of the Spirit. You would have to purposely throw it away somehow. But once you have peace, God does not remove that peace. You can walk away from it, but he doesn't take it away. I've seen quality ministry that was done years ago. Even when we did children. Rabbit Boy, my favorite. Killed his rabbit, accidentally tripped and fell. Felt like a murderer. Prayed him through that. Years later, as a teenager... He said, you remember me? And I'm going, no. He goes, too many years. I'm a rabbit boy. And I went, oh, okay. He says, what you taught me in the third grade, I've been using that the, all of my life. And lately, uh, my uncle just passed away. And he was like a father to me. And I had to release him and myself the same way that I did when I killed that pet rabbit. The same principle. You know, at funerals, they say, Father, into thy hands we commit the spirit. That could be healing or lip service. It could be either one. Father, into thy hands we commit the spirit. It would greatly diminish grieving. Or you could just say prayers. Pray after me prayers. The preacher at the, at the, at the funeral said, Father, into thy hands we commit your spirit. And you go, yeah, amen. And it didn't do a simple thing in you except stir maybe some sentiment. Can you understand the difference that it has to be for real from the heart? The matters of the heart are the heart of the matter and it's never going to change. There is so much we do cerebrally that sounds so good and it's scriptural and it's accomplishing no true inner change. Now, I'm going to I want to get me someone that's kind of new at this. Can I have, Marilyn, would you be willing to come up and pray? Now, in private, we would give the information. She's rather new to the fellowship, so she can't know all the things that you know-it-alls know. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to do first feel forgive, but we're not going to name names because okay. we got people here. Okay? All right. Close your eyes. Is that step one? What happens when people close their eyes? They have a tendency to get the attitude of prayer and they go, oh. And see, she's yielding right now. She's enjoying God. That's your Jesus. That peace is him. He himself is our peace. Now, first person or situation that comes to mind, nod your head. Feel the feeling. Stay focused on that person here. Don't change the picture. Down here. 
can you name the feeling? Say it out loud. Just the feeling. Hate. Anger. Hurt. Anger usually has some hurt with it. You hurt. Anger is secondary. I let Jesus the forgiver in me. That's in you. Jesus the forgiver. We are forgiving right through that hurt, anger toward him, out of my belly. Oh, Marilla, there you go. Except you don't do what I just did. You don't tell them, there you go. They have to have their own no, so. You change the piece? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see how gentle this was? Now, let's stay up here. One minute, you're almost done. <laughs> if there would have been demonic activity, and that just happened to be that hatred towards somebody, if that was where the hitchhiker had permission to torment you, once you close that door and release loving forgiveness, it has to go. It, it's a legalist. It needs legal ground. And if you close the doors of emotional wounding in your heart, there's no legal ground. You submit to God and you resist and he flees. But he doesn't have to flee if he's got legal ground. So we want to close the legal ground. Good? Could you tell that she had a real exchange? Did you have a real exchange? And it changed the peace. Now test the spirit, because we're not playing some kind of game here. This is transformation. This is partaking of the divine nature. All right? Close your eyes. Picture the person. And the hate should be gone forever. Now... You may have to pray through that person for specifics. And if you pray mother or father, and you have that hostility, rejection, anger, hurt toward mother or father, and all you see is their face, I've learned this over 40-some years. This is not a rule, but this, if you see just their face and you forgive them and it's quality, you probably have plenty of specifics. You're just scratching the surface dealing with mom and dad. You only saw their face. Eventually... There'll be the time that he did this, the time that he did that, the time she did this, the time she did that. And when certain specifics are dealt with, it's almost like a root issue and a clarity comes in a particular area of your perception. Okay, thank you very much. So in other words, it's far too common to see children in the same family have different impressions of mom and dad. So perception is everything. So it's not just that mom or dad did something. It's really where they need the healing is their perception of what they did, good or bad. They may be right, they may be wrong. But it's very interesting that children always had different opinions. So I want to do something right here while I've got just a couple minutes left. Um, we used to do this when we travel because it expedites the ministry time <laughs> and when you have a short window. On a scale of 1 to 10, close your eyes, on a scale of 1 to 10, how safe did you feel with your father? Don't tell me, but just slip up your hand if you have a number. How safe did you feel with your father? Okay. On a scale of 1 to 10, meaning 10, super safe, 1, not so safe, okay? On a scale of 1 to 10 with Father, how important did you feel in his eyes? On a scale of 1 to 10, how important were you in his eyes? Okay. Now, do you see what's next? Mom. Honor your mother and father doesn't mean honor their bad behavior, but you need to deal with the low scores in your heart. I've even prayed with people who saw dad was a 10, but they made dad a god. 
over God. So your perception is important. But for the most part, the lower scores are the ones that have need for ministry. Okay, do mom on a scale of 1 to 10. How safe did you feel with her? On a scale of 1 to 10, how important was I in her eyes? On a scale of 1 to 10. You have just found the areas that you should pursue in an internal work to get closer to God. Because mom and dad, how you view mom and dad, will transfer to how you view God. Even if you, your head knows better, there will be, there'll be a lack of security, a lack of feeling special or important, the lack of feeling safe. Uh, many people have had an, had an angry father see God as just waiting for them to mess up so he can smack them. You know, all of your uh, evaluation of your parents needs to transcend to what God says about himself and what he says about you. Any areas where you see there's a crossover there where it's too similar is an area for ministry. We used to call that finding fathers but it would always stir up something in a group of people to where we could get some quality ministry before we left in one instance in a group. So we're either going to learn to make the distinction that seeing and saying, all right, cannot be more important than the heart. People say the right answers. That broke, that, it broke my heart when they were like the cream of the crop counselors, Christian counselors. They were going for advanced training. And we started praying with them and found out that they all had the right answers. But when they prayed through the right answers, all of a sudden they realized they had never touched the emotions. They had never really gotten healed of it but yet had the right answers. So, Father, we pray right now that in our private time, we don't do pray after me prayers. We, we pray in order to feel that supernatural exchange or that transaction. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.